We're now gonna take some substances and look at the process of digestion and absorption of those nutrients. So starting with carbohydrates, you can tell this is a piece of toast, right? Toast contains starch. Starch is a polysaccharide. The same process would apply if you ate other polysaccharides and could possibly spill them. I can't spell this right now. Saccharide. Starch is going to be broken down into disaccharides. In the process of that, there's, it doesn't just go from like poly, like long, long, long chain to disaccharides. You're becoming oligosaccharides in between. Um, but to get from starch or other polysaccharide to disaccharides, it's amylase that does that. Salivary amylase is one location and then pancreatic amylase. So depending on how much you chew, you may do more of this process in your mouth versus in your duodenum. You wanna give your pancreas a break, maybe chew for longer. I don't know if that's a thing. I think your pancreas will still produce am amylase. So salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase break down starch, glycogen, other polysaccharides that you're eating into these oligo and then disaccharides. To go from disaccharides to monosaccharides, which is what we need to absorb, we need to have brush border enzymes. So let me go to monosaccharides. Am I spelling it the same way at all? I think it's supposed to be A in there. I'm not going to test you on your spelling of saccharides. Okay. Monosaccharides that are absorbed include um, galactose, glucose, fructose. Those are common monosaccharides. Just to give some context, let me add a few disaccharides. So lactose, and sucrose are probably ones you've heard of. Lacto you also could ingest lactose or sucrose just straight up, right? And not have to have your salivary amylase do anything. You also can eat glucose and fructose. But this is, if we're starting with the polysaccharide, with this piece of toast here. So the enzymes that do this are brush border enzymes. Where are brush border enzymes located? In the brush border of your enterocytes. And I've got a picture of this in a moment. So this is in the small intestine. There's all types because we need to break down a lot of different types of disaccharides. Um, so lactase, maltase, sucrase, dextrinase, et cetera. Let's look at this with the picture. Here is our starch molecule. Let's assume that our saliva didn't do much or maybe we um, swallowed it without chewing, swallowed a piece of toast. Here's our starch. It's broken up by pancreatic amylase to form these disaccharides. Disaccharides still can't be taken into the enterocytes, the absorptive cells. They need to be broken down. That occurs via these brush border enzymes. So we've got one, two. Now they can be absorbed. Absorption is oop, this whole shebang here. This guy is also going to be important, but this is the actual process of absorption. We're getting glucose, let's just call it, from out here into the capillary. Let's look at how we do this. Hopefully you're realizing 
you know this already and I've taught you it so many times. So this might look familiar. How does glucose move from the lumen of the intestine to the ECF, ultimately then to the, to the bloodstream? Let's add bloodstream here, capillary, ECF, that's the same thing as ISF, right? Interstitial fluid, extracellular fluid. In interstitial refers to around the tissues, extracellular refers to outside of the cell, um, anything outside of the cell. Capillary fluid would actually be a type of ECF. Okay, the anatomy here you've seen, right? Um, apical surface, basal or basolateral surface, tight junctions between epithelial cells, so we cannot move this way. I go through the cell. There is high glucose inside the cell, lower glucose in the lumen. If you've just eaten a large amount of glucose, this might slightly be different, but basically this is gonna stay real high. Um, it's all relative. This is gonna be low here, partially because it's being carried away into the blood constantly. So how do we do this? First of all, we need some proteins. We need three proteins. We need to establish a sodium gradient. We're gonna have secondary active transport here, right? We need to have a sodium. And, well, first of all, we just need this protein always. All of our cells have high sodium outside of them and low, relatively low sodium inside. This is established by our sodium potassium ATP pump that is present on all cells. This pump establishes this, this gradient. So given that, we can now use that gradient to co-transport sodium with glucose into the cell. Why couldn't glucose just move without that co-transporter? It was not down its gradient. There's high glucose inside the cell already. It cannot diffuse even with facilitated diffusion into the cell. It can't, it's not going to go that way. There are not pumps for large molecules like glucose. So this co-transporter um, is used to bring glucose in along with sodium. Sodium's going down its gradient. Once glucose is in here, so glucose is moving in, glucose, 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 lots of glucose coming in. There's lots of these co-transporters. It can then diffuse via facilitated diffusion out a glucose transporter on the basal surface. So apical surface, we've got the co-transporter. Basal surface, we've got the glucose transporter. We don't need to use sodium here because this is down its gradient. So let's label what these things are. Choose a different color here. This is facilitated diffusion. This is active transport. This is co-transport and specifically secondary active transport. It cannot act without primary active transport. It relies on active transport indirectly. 